Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Ada Agada. I'll be speaking on the topic, the philosophy of conservationism. Good. Now I proceed with my talk and start sharing my screen now. The objectives of this talk are as follows. To present conservationism as a 21st century African philosophical synthesis. I also unpack the idea of mood, which underguides conservationism. And at the same time, link it with the idea of God. My talk. We also explore the concept of a human being as homo melancholicus. Finally, I will conclude by responding to two basic questions of conservationism. Namely, is the universe pointless? And two, is human life meaningless? So we get, we get this in mind as I proceed with the talk. Conservation and conservationism. Conservationism is a term I coined to describe the philosophy of conservation, a 21st century African philosophical synthesis that seeks to respond to the two basic questions of is the universe pointless and is human life meaningless? So the term conservation is a third category that captures the, the condition of entities that exist in a, in a universe that we've described as tragic. A universe that strives, that reveals evidence of striving, of yearning, even as the goal of this striving can never be attained. So conservation is a third category that captures that tragic condition of yearning entities that never reaches their goal, that never reach their goal. Conservationism is the, the philosophical architecture within which the concept of conservation is articulated. So why conservation captures a condition of entities in the Yeni universe, conservationism is a metaphysical system, the intellectual architecture under which, within which the conservation is articulated. In this system of conservationism, the idea of mode is pivotal. Since everything in the universe is defined as Either mode or the expression manifestation of mood. So let us now move to the next section. What is mood? It's a good question. The idea of mood. My idea of mood evolves within the philosophic tradition called African philosophy. It follows from my quest for a fundamental principle within which I can articulate a comprehensive metaphysics that accounts for the reality of the universe and the condition of human beings. This search for a fundamental principle is not entirely a new one. The philosophers Placid Tempest, Kwai Mejechi, Mogobe Ramose and Innocent ourselves in their different ways try to identify fundamental principles that will enable them to articulate a thorough going metaphysical system. In Tasse Tempest, we have the idea of the vital force, a principle that animates the universe, conceived by him as 
is she from God? And enlivening everything in the universe and emitting everything. So God, human beings, lesser divinities, vegetable life, mineral existence, they all possess this vital force. However, tempest did not go far enough to give the idea of vital force a compelling philosophical formulation. In Jack, in you also find this. We also see the quest for a fundamental universal, fundamental and limiting principle, a thorough going principle that can account for the universe and all the entities within it. JJ arrived at what he calls the Sun Sun, a non material principle that animates everything in the universe. He also, like Tempest, conceived it as issuing from God. Ramo said, just like Jechi, arrives at what he calls being becoming, as universal being, as that which manifests itself as incessant change, eternal becoming. As also advances the thoughts of Tempest, Jechi and Ramo say in his attempt to arrive at a complementary metaphysics, that account for the noted African complementary and complementaristic worldview. Whereas in ourselves, we fail to find a singular term to capture what this fundamental principle is. We, also, we can find the idea of missing links, which seeks to define the account for the reality of being. According to ourselves, being is that on account of which whatever exists serve as a missing link of reality. So we can see that from tempest to get to ourselves, there has been an attempt to identify what being is. Why tempest sticks being with vital first and jet free with sun sun and Rama say with being keep becoming or Eternal becoming or change. Asal is not directly forthcoming. He does not identify anything that we can call being. Rather, he tells us that being is that on account of which anything that exists serves a missing link of reality. So with Asal, we find a question mark. He suggests that being is that which is incomplete, that whatever, whatever is universal, that being which is indeed universal is that which reveals itself as an incompleteness. Taking up the problem from where this color stopped, I arrived at the concept of mood as the fundamental principle in the conservationist universe. I realized that for mood to account for the for entities in the universe, to extend the universe in any satisfactory manner, it must be able to tell us account for the reality of physical as well as immaterial or non-physical phenomena. Hence, I defined I articulated mood as a consciousness matter principle, the consciousness matter interface, a totality, a unity of the material and the non-material dimensions of the universe. It reveals itself as yen. Its essence is yen. Mood underlies all the entities in the universe, be it God, human beings, deities, uh, inanimate things, everything is, is back an expression of mood. So mood is then a unity, a totality of the material and the non-material, what African philosophers like to call the spiritual. 
So here we have a precise definition of mood. Mood is the primordial mind matter interface, the source of all intelligence in the world, all emotions in the universe. It is that we a borderless border. We are borders distinguishing the phenomenon of mind from matter are constantly transgressed. So that it makes more sense for us to talk about faces of reality. That is the material and immaterial faces of reality rather than strictly minds and material realities. So when we see a rock, for instance, we, we can talk of this rock as a physical thing, but also as an entity with a non-physical dimension, which will now consist in its micro history, in the fact that it exists to be perceived by a mind and becomes a part of a totality, an experiential totality, totality which is revealed itself as at once material and immaterial. So mood is a primordial mind matter phenomenon, a principle that animates the universe, infects and affects everything in this universe. Nothing escapes mood. And since mood is defined by the essence of journey, it is always an incompleteness. So the incomplete being, which ourselves struggles to articulate, emerges as the incomplete mind matter phenomenon, phenomenon of the conservationist thinker. Okay, now that I've attempted to give an idea of what mood is as a mind matter unity, a universal animating principle with a material and an immaterial dimension, which underlies everything, informs everything, and defines the universe as journey. Let us see how mood is related to God. The question of God, the theme of God, occupies a place of pride in the conservationist universe. So we are now moving on. In African philosophy, we can broadly identify two views of God, the transcendental and the limitation views. Proponents of the transcendental view hold that God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent. That is, is a perfect and necessary being. While proponents of the limitation view hold that God, traditional African thought, conceives God as only a high deity, limited both in power and knowledge, and not only this, but God is also limited in goodness. I situate the conservationist idea of modes in this in this literature with a bias for the limitation view. Since I have already conceived mode as a universal limiting principle, having the essence of incompleteness. Since this is a case, the universe is incomplete and so imperfect. If the universe is incomplete and imperfect, its creator or its architect or its designer must, by that very reason, also be an imperfect being. Now, with God conceived as limited in power, knowledge, and goodness, we can see that it is mood that limits God. If mood limits God, then mood is the supreme being. Mood is rather the most universal and the basic reality. It is what we call being. 
with a with a capital B and gold. Now B is a green bean, but with a small letter B. God is not a first cause. If by first cause we mean a creator, ex nihilo, or a being that creates the universe out of nothing. Mood is eternal. As all this existed, God creates the world out of materials supplied by mood. With mood posited as eternal, it limits, it automatically limits God. So we now see that God is also a creature of moods. He, do, he does not predate moods, but he is powerful and knowledge to the extent that we can describe it as a being who is able to manipulate the resources of moods and in the process create a universe at all. So why moods? Is a universal limiting principle that also limits God. It is not an entity. However, God is an entity, one that is limited by moods. Thus, the world that God creates out of the resources of mood is a dated world within a universe that is eternal and animated by the phenomenon, the principle of moods. Now, having described, having articulated the relationship between mood and God, I will proceed with this, the next important pivotype in conservationist philosophy, which is the human being. But before then, I will emphasize that the universe of mode is a tragic universe because it is a universe of yearning, one in an eternal process of becoming with a goal which human beings cannot discern, but which, is, which must endure all the same since this universe reveals the character of striving. They cannot be striving any without a purpose. Although we cannot identify exactly what this purpose is, it must exist for there to be a, a becoming. However, there is no harm in speculating. Consolationist philosophy speculates that the goal of the universe is perfection, the attainment of perfection or completeness. The, elim the elimination of moral evil as well as physical evil. Yet, since the universe is eternal becoming, continuous change, unending striving, this goal, according to the speculative system of conservationism, is unattainable. If the goal of perfection is unattainable in a striving universe, such a universe is a tragic universe. In such an imperfect universe, the one in which we find ourselves, evils are real. But physical, what we call physical evils, harm that may be caused by factors beyond the control of human beings, as well as moral evil, which is harm caused by factors instigated by human beings. In such a universe, these evils are real. They are incurable. Although perhaps through our human efforts, we can ameliorate these evils. So we then have a tragic universe, but not a pointless universe. A pointless universe would be one without a purpose. But our universe is a seeking, striving, yearning universe. It must then have a purpose. We may not know what this purpose is, but it is certainly out there. And since this universe cannot attain its self-indicated purpose, it is a tragic universe. And all beings that exist in such a universe are tragic beings. Now, I articulate the concept of homo melaconicus. The term homolacolicus simply means the melancholy being 
I use it specifically to describe the human being as a conscious being. We can, of course, extend it to all entities in the universe that are capable of feeling and thinking, or have the ability to feel and think just like human beings. So the homo, homo melancholicus is the entity that finds itself in an imperfect universe, one it did not create, whose purpose the being does not know. Although such a being can speculate about the purpose of the universe as perfection, the term melancholy is used in a technical sense to describe the fact that the homo melancholicus is a being fit for conservation and not perfection. This being is capable of evil. It is a victim as well as a perpetrator of evil. In a world in which its existence is dictated, it persists for a while, actualizes some of its goals, and then it moves, lives, moves out of existence without reaching any knowledge of why indeed it exists and the purpose of the universe in which it finds itself beyond speculation about perfection being the goal of this universe. For the being of consolation, its condition is melancholy. And melancholy involves the capacity to balance the affects or emotion of joy and sadness. For although the melancholy being is able to actualize joy in its many creation processes, sadness is always its condition. It always falls back on the mood of sadness. Its joy merely highlights the ever-present meanness of sadness. So melancholy describes the balancing act of joy, of the act of balancing joy and sadness of continuously seeking to maximize the emotion of joy while diminishing the emotion of sadness. A being condemned to such a balancing act is a melancholy being. Such a being, I as said, is a Homo melancholicus. The human being is precisely such a being. For Homo melancholicus, the meaning of life is a pursuit of the maximization of the emotion of joy from moment to moment. Hence, such a being is also a being of consolation. The meanings we create in our lives, which enhances, increases our joy constitutes all that we have, they constitute our consolation. But then when we ask this question, if joy is real, does it mean that human life and the universe are meaningful? We already seen that the universe is a tragic expression of mood. Is this universe meaningful or pointless? And is human life also? which is situated in this universe, is it pointless or meaningless? We have seen that the universe is not pointless. What about the human being? Well, the answer is rather pessimistic. I'm afraid human life is ultimately meaningless. Why is this the case? Because pain and suffering they follow homo melancholicus from birth to death. Indeed, we create more meanings from moment to moment in the maximization of the affect of joy. But for how long can we continue to create this meaning to increase our joy, to prolong our conservation? We can only do that perhaps not for not more than 100 years for most human beings. And for those who may be lucky or maybe unlucky, for not more than 120 years. The more normal lifespan of human being we probably never stretch between if beyond 130 years. So the creation, the mini creation processes cannot last beyond 130 years. Eventually, homo, homo melancholicus is condemned to death. But death itself 
it is not the event of death itself that is a tragedy, the source of the meaninglessness. It is a fact that the life of Homo melancholicus comes to an end without his being reaching certain knowledge about why it was born, why it had to exist, and why this universe in which it exists in its turn has to exist. So we see that there is this, there is ultimately incoherence that marks the life of Homo melancholicus. One, he does not know why it was born, why it exists. Two, he does also not know why the universe exists beyond the speculation that the universe might exist to achieve perfection. One, which consolation is in thesis is impossible. So why there is meaning in life, meaning in the pursuit from moment to moment of the effect of joy, ultimately human life is meaningless. Consolation is inadequate in the face of human ignorance of the purpose of life. And the ultimate, the final goal of the universe. But then this pessimism, we must temper this pessimism because why life? Why life about why there is life? There's also a practical interest in living. Suicide itself is futile. It is a cowardly research that does not in any way improve the human condition. So the interest in practical living compels us to at least overlook the meaninglessness, which encompasses us and the contents with consolation for the sake of living. Now, so the universe is not pointless since it is in a state of eternal becoming. Becoming is motivated by yearning, by striving, with this striving pointing at the teleological concept of perfection. True, this perfection is impossible, but it is indicated. And even if we may be wrong, if I can be accused of speaking anthropomorphically, of, pro of projecting human hopes and interests into the objective universe, the fact that this universe is eternal becoming indicates that there is indeed a purpose toward which it strives. This purpose, of course, may not be perfection, but the purpose is there. Since there is such a purpose, the universe is not pointless. It is human life that is pointless, as I've already submitted. Thank you for listening to my talk. I now proceed to take questions if you have questions to ask.